Good afternoon and welcome to our last panel of the day here, um, the ETF Outlook panel. Uh, we, um, it's a pretty broad topic. Uh, we're going to try to hit upon the areas that we think will be important for the ETF industry over the next uh, 12 to 18 months or so. Um, my name is Tom Champion. I'm on the Exchange Traded Product Group at the New York Stock Exchange. We are the number one uh, exchange for both listing and trading of ETPs. Um, I have our panel here. I will let them all introduce themselves. They know themselves and their organizations better than I do. Um, and I'll kick it off with you, Joanna. Sure. My name is Joanna Galagos. I work at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. I head up, well, I was for the last three years heading up uh, U.S. product development, and I've just stepped into the head of U.S. ETF role a few weeks ago. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Puin Tantasud. I'm with uh, BlackRock, specifically fixed income ETFs. Um, represent our 85 odd lineup to all client types and basically act as a liaison between our investment team and, and just all clients that may need education, research, thought papers, anything of that nature. Uh, David Sharp, Vanguard. I work as a capital markets specialist on our capital markets team. Um, our main focus on that team is to really provide the most, uh, the greatest experience that we can for the ETF client. Uh, trying to uh, lower spreads, provide liquidity in the products, and allow for uh, deep tradable markets within our products. Thank you, guys. Um, right now in the ETF space, there's approximately 2,000 ETFs listed in the U.S. Um, with approximately $3 trillion in assets under management. I think we read a lot of times that maybe there is too many ETFs. So I'm going to kick off the first question to Joanna. And, and ask that simple question. Do you think there are too many ETFs in the U.S. market? Um, I don't. I think that if you compare it to the number of investment products that are out in the U.S. market, it's a very small number. I think we have, what would you say, around 2,000, did you say? 2,000 exchange trader products. I think it's 2,007 as of today. Yeah, and yeah. so if you, if you were to compare and contrast that to the available strategies that you might see across in the mutual fund structure, you, you wouldn't really balk at that number at all. Um, what I see is a really big opportunity for the ETF industry to start bringing more choice of product and choice of provider. So, you know, the history of ETFs in terms of the type of products they have is a really big toolkit that can be very narrow and very specific. And so that's why it may feel like there's an app for that. Well, there's an ETF for that. You can get any kind of cut of a sector product you want in ETFs. But there is an enormous opportunity to differentiate with other products and strategies that, that don't exist in providers like J.P. Morgan. Um, namely, I mean, the most glaring thing for me as um, a product developer in the ETFs is just looking at two things. I mean, one is all of those 2,000 ETFs, there's a very small number of them or a pretty small percentage of them that are all, um, well, that are, that are not market cap weighted. So, you know, market cap weighted ETFs are the story of the day. And I like to say that what we got to get in a vision set for going forward is that Active does not equal mutual fund, and passive does not equal ETFs. So just right there in active management, there's a lot of things that um, new providers can bring to bear. And also in fixed income, which I'll let Quinn take that up, but um, in fixed income, there still are many, many, many missing solutions despite an enormous amount of choice. Yeah, and I just wanted to echo Joanna's thoughts there. So in, in fixed income space in particular, if you look at the fixed income market, which we estimate to be around 50 trillion or so, about 7% of that is currently sitting in fixed income mutual funds. Less than 1% of that is, uh, is in fixed income ETFs. So we think that rather than focusing on the number of funds out there, it's more important to think about the AUM trend, right? And the fact that for many kind of channels out there, whether you're an insurance company or an asset manager or things of that nature, you still have needs for a more modular approach. So you have the ability to kind of cut benchmarks into various different ways, whether they be smart beta or whether they be just finer segmentations of the market, so long as the index can allow for that. So we think there's a tremendous amount of runway left to go. Yeah, so I, I certainly agree with, uh, with my fellow panelists here that um, there is certainly room for innovation. Um, it's been said before that all the easy ideas in ETFs have already been uh, kind of put to play already, but um, that leads to you know, a lot of innovation, creativity across the different issuers and, and trying to enter spaces that are going to be important to clients. 
Um, from a capital markets perspective, though, there is a little bit of a concern with some of the growth uh, because of two reasons, two elements that fit within the ETF ecosystem that's important to us from a capital markets perspective. And that's really seed and lead. And what I mean by that is uh, the seed partner um, is going to be the market maker that is going to work with uh, an issuer when a new product is launching um, to help bring that product to market. They're going to be the first owner of that product, the natural seller in the marketplace uh, when that launches on day one. There is a capital cost to that. You do tie up capital if you are a seed partner for security. Um, and then the, ele the other element of that is the lead market maker. And lead market maker is in charge of uh, really ensuring that that product has uh, liquidity in the marketplace so that the client has the best experience possible. And when we look at uh, the landscape, there's, again, 2007 ETFs in the marketplace. Uh, just looking this morning, the 30-day uh, average daily volume, there's 919 that don't trade over 10,000 shares. And that could be difficult for a lead market maker who is in charge of offsetting their risk on a daily basis and um, could tie up some of their capital there and some, some of their risks. So I think although innovation is, is very good and important, um, I think it's very important for new issuers that are entering the space to be really mindful of, is there a need for this product? Um, is there a client demand? And will that client demand come in and uh, offset some of the capital requirements that our market-making partners need to put up? I think that's a really good point when you frame it that way, is that there's another part of the ecosystem that supports a product we can develop all we want as an issuer, but then can you support that product by ensuring that you've positioned it very well before you launch? You have a sales team in place that can support clients so that you can help them understand the new product and make awareness of the product. And then ultimately that leads to what you're talking about, David, which is a momentum within trading and a, and, and a way to offset those capital costs. I think that another good example of the way the industry is innovating is more larger asset managers are coming to the ETF industry. So you see firms like mine who entered, you know, we've been at this for a while, but we entered the market in 2013. We launched our first product in 2014. Since then, you know, you've seen a lot of activity from Matt and Fidelity and Lake Mason. And so you'll start to see, you know, more you know, larger providers that can support the early days of getting those products up to, up and going, support them with sales teams and their clients. And it will be interesting to see, I think, in the next five years, what the complexion of, like, the top ten looks like. Um, so we'll see. And, um, Dave, maybe you can expand on that a little bit, too, um, the whole lead and seat argument. How does that impact the end investors of ETFs? Um, I think, I mean, the, the key is that you want to make sure that um, any of those products are going to be trading as, as liquid as possible. You certainly want to, um, you don't want to have products that are trading with a very wide spread um, or that can't handle a large trade if you are going to uh, enter that, um, that security and, and be, you know, there's not a lot of a lot of other clients there with you. If you go to redeem, um, certainly there could be more market impact as they, they take on a little bit more risk. Um, I think where it, it really can affect um, clients is, is when that product launches. Every product has to get off the ground, no matter if it's Vanguard that, mm -hmm. that issues it, if it's um, iShares, if it's JP Morgan, it's, there is a process to get that product off the ground. <laughs> And um, what a, a lot of the fears could be is that you launch a product that is stillborn, that when it, it comes out, it doesn't have that client demand. And when that client demand is not met, um, for those clients that did think that it was a good investment, they could, be, uh, found, they could find themselves in a product that is, does not trade as healthy as, it, as other products could. I think just to really put it out there, David, it means cost, right? It means cost to them. And, yeah. and so that's where you want to... You know, keep an eye on whether it's it's taking off and have the right firm that can help it. Is there particular asset classes for ETFs where you find it more difficult to get that um, initial seed or a lead market maker for? I'll just throw that out to the whole panel. I think it's probably a good one for, for Quinn because I think fixed income, especially just due to the, the nature of that market, um, you... You, there's not, you can't trade necessarily 16 shares of uh, 18 shares, which is the smallest holding in, in the S&P 500 when you're in the bond market. You really want to be trading in, in, in larger size. So 
And if you yeah, want no, to talk I, more about that. I think that. Just, just two examples, and there are plenty, but if you think about kind of an EM suite, right, many people are familiar with kind of emerging markets as a concept. Not many are familiar that, you know, perhaps you can go hard currency, local currency, and have corporate debt as well. And how do you balance the two? So perhaps something like local currency or even corporate currency, which we have offerings, uh, sorry, corporate um, EM, which we have offerings for, that may take a longer time from an education perspective to go on. Uh, something else that we've been kind of top of mind is, as well um, is, is our I-bond suite, right? So you think about um, having a bond ladder approach where historically advisors and, and even asset managers, some insurance companies had ladders to fulfill long date, longer dated liabilities. Well, in fact, you can actually structure a fund that can mature like a bond and preserve the yield to maturity profile. It's a more nuanced conversation. It's a more kind of even kind of esoteric portion of the market where it takes a longer lead time, a longer educational path. It takes many more conversations for p people to get comfortable with that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> just for the record, the exchange position is that there is definitely not too many ETFs. <laughs> um, so uh, just one housekeeping item too. If uh, any time during the panel somebody's got a question, feel free to raise their hand. We'll also leave some time at the end for questions as well. Um, <clears throat> now that we've talked about whether or not there's too many ETFs or is, is the market overcrowded, if it's not, where do um, you expect to see the most growth? And I know uh, Joanna and Quinn talked about fixed income. Are there other areas of ETFs that you see um, have a pretty good growth trajectory over the next few years? You guys want to take that? I can. If you want to start with I don't want to bogart the <laughs> answer. Um, uh, we still have a lot of work to do in fixed income in terms of a solution set. Um, there is, in, in my experience, there are, uh, clients are telling me that they hire active managers in fixed income because they feel like you know there's a, there's some more expertise and skill that needs to be applied to those markets. So I think my answer is going to be heavily filtered through an active lens where I think there are solutions and as you know we had a great panel. I really liked the discussion that we had a few minutes ago about you know how you think about selecting an active manager. Um, so I think active fixed income is, is a great place to grow. Um, there's been, there are great products in market. There should be more. Um, the factor-based investing, which has really grown in the last four or five years, will continue to grow. And I think it'll start to extend into a place which we'll probably get to later, which is you know, on the, we're on the cusp again of looking at another innovation in ETF, which would be active shares or, you know, periodically disclosed um, ETFs. So where this is where the holdings are not disclosed every day. They may be disclosed on a, a certain lag. It could be a month, could be a quarter. That's a place that has not been touched by ETFs. And, you know, the industry's been working for a decade to bring this to market. So, you know, keep your eyes out for, again, more product choice, um, different types of active strategies I think are going to grow quite a bit in the next two to five years. Yeah, and just to echo that, I think I think smart beta fix in particular is, is very yeah. interesting because it may take the same shape that the equity kind of smart beta landscape has done, whereas, you know, we started off with kind of single factors, right, which, which is basically as old as time, right, the whole concept of investing for value, investing for quality, how do you position yourself for a bear market? Um, I think of smart beta fix as being, you know, just slightly more nuanced than that, right? Because if you if you just isolate for one value, say quality, for example, you may get some of the lower yielding sectors in, in the market. So it's up to issuers to see how can we innovate based off of this and can we tilt a little bit more towards value so that I can also be protected and be more forward looking from that perspective. So I think there's a lot of work to be done there where issuers need to be thinking very smartly about you know, I want, it, I want my investor to have a good experience throughout the cycle, all right? I think um, the use cases, the growth in use cases will grow tremendously, right? We already talked about the ecosystem as it revolves around the entire ETF landscape. Um, what's, what's little also known that many others um, are, are starting to get akin to is the growth in the options market, right? So that's going to beget even more liquidity. What that means for folks in the room are that Look, I mean, if you think about liquidity, right, yes, we know that liquidity has grown, but the diversity of that liquidity is something that's going to help innovation and help other users be more comfortable with the market as well. 
So I would echo a lot of, um, of, of what the, the panelists had said around uh, certainly the factor base. I think um, whether it be smart beta, factor base, however we want to label that, um, on both the equity and bond side, it, it's, it's intriguing. I think we've all heard a lot of talk about smart beta over the last few years as the next innovation. And not all the flows have really come there to kind of back up a lot of the, uh, the marketing and, and, um, and just kind of the drive towards that just yet. But I think that we're on the precipice of seeing that being used more. Um, the low cost advantage that you have in many ETFs, I think, naturally lends itself as the next space where you can kind of get an active type of portfolio um, using different factors, multi-factors, um, to, to really try to get some alpha above the, the beta products that are out there. Um, the other space that I think is interesting, we'll see how it grows. We've seen a lot of growth globally, but not as much here in the U.S., is the ESG space. Mm. Um, the environmental uh, social governance space is one that it's a very difficult nut to crack because it's there's so many opinions on what would be included and what's not. How do you divest from it? Do you market weight it? Exactly how to go about that approach, I think, is slowing down a little bit the kind of the next level of innovation in that space. Um, but I think that that's an area where we'll we'll continue to see some growth uh, from the issuers as well. Okay. And Quinn, uh, before you touched upon sort of the institutional channels for ETFs and and the growth there. Um, where do you see, um, what segments of the institutional market do you see that growth coming from? Um, yes, so, so thanks. So just a couple um, really to highlight. Well, if you think about where we think the trajectory will be going forward, um, for one, there's in the insurance company space, right? So you think about insurance companies and, and general assets and the difficulty for small to mid-sized insurers to access um, bonds in the market post-crisis with diminished diminished dealer balance sheets, right? We estimate that there's probably five trillion sitting on general account assets in fixed income, and only 10 basis points of that or less is actually sitting in fixed income ETFs. So their ability to adopt that, use that equitized cash, right? Think about more creative ways to access the market, handle cash flow, and then take delivery of the bonds through the redeem. Um, that's going to only continue to grow. On the asset manager side, as well as the pension community as well, pensions were discussed earlier today. Um, if you think about what the challenge is from, from, from their perspective, it's really um, twofold. One is it's, it's a hedging story, right? It's, it's much harder and harder to hedge certain kind of more, more opaque asset classes, if you will, high yield EM, whereas the synthetics of the world were not necessarily, like you think about CDX, right? They're not necessarily a good match for what you're trying to hedge your book with. So perhaps there's an options trade that you can do. So we think of that as, as helping them think about it. And more and more, just quite simply, asset managers overall are warming up to the idea that ETFs are not out there to take their jobs. They're out there really to think about how can I add another tool to my toolkit and generate even more kind of above uh, benchmark returns. So those, those really kind of three channels are, are what I would highlight. And I think that that's um, you know, an area where we, we've seen uh, the, the use of ETFs as a, as a beta exposure, um, if it's a value type fund for an active manager, they might just get that beta exposure while they look for the value. Um, to, put, to Quinn's point, the traditional asset managers and the insurance general account, the fixed income ETFs are just a very uh, easy to digest strategy there to uh, fulfill the liquidity constraint issue. Um, if you look at uh, our product, our long-term corporate product, BCLT, we estimate that that basket could be as wide as 120 basis points if you were to buy all the securities in a, in a long-duration corporate part of the market. Um, you can trade our ETF for under 10 basis points. So for a, a manager that wants to get some of that exposure, while they look for relative value even within their portfolios um, and their bond portfolios, it gives them a, a great opportunity for a liquid instrument where you can get broad exposure, uh, hold that even if it's just for a short time, and then um, get out of that easily. And it's also kind of leading to larger and larger block size trading, right? So if you think about where we were in some of our larger liquid credit ETFs in 09, right, this is when really they, they really kind of got their underpinning and started to grow dramatically in volumes because why? The OTC market was shut down. So, you know, a common complaint that I hear from some advisors is, you know, I'm not, I'm not comfortable with fixed income ETFs because of the liquidity concern, or I had a bad experience in 94, 96 with my bond funds. Well, keep in mind that around 09, around the taper tantrum, around the stress, the credit stress that we saw at the end of 15, 
all they did in terms of credit ETS was surge in liquidity. And so today, what you have is a situation where we estimate anywhere between 15 to 20 percent of the trading that's done in a ticker like HYG or LQD is really at that 10 million or plus size. So it's really allowed the liquidity to be broad as well as diversified, where you know, not everyone's selling all at the same time. You may have buyers step in and do hedging activity or, or other types of activity as well. I think it brings up a really good point. I mean, if we kind of bring it down to the channel, we're, we're really speaking about sophisticated, regular users of ETFs that trade in size, have found a way to incorporate. You guys talked a lot about liquidity strategies. Um, when we get back to asset allocators who may be using these for equitizing cash and sort of, like you said, coming in and out of these while they search for their ideas or their relative value, that's a, that's a trade. You know, we're talking about a trade, and, and that's going to continue. And, con and when you think about growth in the ETF business, you're going to see that get really big. And they're giving you like a, a quick look at why it's going to happen. On the other side, when you think about the, the hurdles of fixed income ETFs and, some, and new strategies that are more complex to explain, I think the industry is still, and Matt had mentioned this too, in the other channels, even with asset managers that are quite sophisticated that don't use ETFs, or within the retail channels, there's a lot that the industry needs to do to continue to explain the exchange traded part. Um, because some of these really successful trading stories that happened during the taper tantrum, and even 9-11, by the way, even all the way back to 9-11, you know, um, uh, IVV and, and SPY, they didn't trade for 17 days and they opened up at the right price for price discovery and that. And so these, they have tons of history to show, you know, that they're battle tested. But those stories don't mean a lot to folks if they don't understand, I usually buy my mutual fund this way and now I'm going to go to a broker and then there's a spread and explain to me how, to, how do I do that and who do I talk to. You'd be amazed at the barbell of it. And so we have to remember as an industry that, you know, especially if you're working towards folks that are asset allocating and are doing long-term investing and you're providing solutions for their long-term investment or their allocation, that there's a massive need still for in, in education because on the downside, what will happen is you'll go into a client, you'll speak to a client that maybe you want to explain this really cool, very important strategy in fixed income to, but they'll remember a headline from the taper tantrum. And then, you know, we will all go back to our, our headquarters and write really long papers about, <laughs> that are very technical and detailed, that are for us, and we give them out to the industry, and it's still, there's a perception and there's an uncomfortable feeling about not understanding these markets. And so that's where, you know, you get a portfolio intersecting with security, and, and I, you know, it's, it's something that we spend a lot of time on just in the field, basic trading 101, and I think that that's going to persist for a long time. If you can get over that, and the technology of the ETF can be more ubiquitous and more understood, like when people want to go buy Google, they don't really question the price of Google when they put their trade in through Charles Schwab. And they, you know, maybe put in a couple different differences in their order type, but that's a big, big hurdle we still haven't really finished. Yeah, you know? um, yeah I think uh, I've been hearing at these conferences the past 10, 15 years, everyone say, you know, don't use market orders. I mean, that's just being the, the extreme example there, but it's, it's uh, yeah, but that, that education has to continue because... That's headline, you know, yeah. and that's what people, people read about, and then it makes <clears throat> them feel like something is really difficult or hard to understand. So, I don't know if you guys have... Yeah, thoughts. I absolutely agree. I think education is imperative um, just because it's, a lot of it is the comfort. Um, some of these are uh, often on the fixed income side, it's people that have been bond traders for their entire uh, career, and now they're trading what's an equity um, in an ETF, and they need to understand a little bit better of how that market works compared to the market that they've been used to. Is there a question? Yeah. Yep. That is uh, in preferreds. Yes. Now that's grown to eighteen billion dollars, and I don't know if it represents ten or twenty percent of that marketplace. But at what point do you get concerned with a passive ETF um, that it's gotten too big? I, I know for I won't say for a fact, but it's been indicated to me. I'm in that space a little bit. That because it's passive, they they go out and buy when they get more money, and many of the holdings, not just one or two, but a number of the holdings, are at negative yields to the call dates because. The call dates are short. Now, as an active manager, you may take a chance on a certain issuer that you don't believe that they'll call their bonds in, even though they may be a high coupon today. But when you're passive and, and there are 15 or 20 or 30 items that 
are being bought with new money at negative yield to calls. I mean, do you think about that, and, and how do you address that? Do you, I mean, mutual funds sometimes cap themselves. I haven't seen that with ETFs yet, other than the GDXJ, the, you know, the gold miners, because they had other problems. Yeah, and I, I think it, it raises a, a very important question that we all need to kind of think long and hard about. Um, at some point, too big will be a, a very real question, but I don't think we're there yet. For something like preferreds, we think about it in, 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 in two ways, right? It's not always the case, and this is kind of a mechanics question, where flows come in and we all of a sudden have to kind of rush out and buy that market. We tend to leverage kind of the in-kind creation redemption process, and so that kind of helps kind of mitigate a little bit of that balance as well. And then secondly, we think about, um, you know, again, the diversity of passive investors, right? So the, the diversity of your investor base, where you, not everyone is buying or selling at the same time. So yes, we are rules-based, we're index following. That's, that's very true, that's, you, you know, we have to buy a certain number of the issuance and the float outstanding in the market. But we think it's, it's just a slightly more nuanced conversation than something like a mutual fund, where we think of the overall mutual fund space in a certain segment as still being larger than that, and that posing mm -hmm. you know, slightly, more, you know, slightly more risk if you were to try to target something, but still kind of a small portion relative to the all-in concern there. Anybody else on the panel have thoughts about that? Good. Yeah, thank you. Um, Joanna, earlier uh, in this uh, panel, you brought up the partially disclosed, or um, a lot of people like to call it non-transparent, but we're trying to find a different name for it. <laughs> yeah. So periodically disclosed, <laughs> we we're, we're, we're going to try to use that for, for yeah. now on. Um, right now, only about 1% of ETF assets are in actively managed ETFs, um, and they have to disclose their holdings. Um, I know JP Morgan, over the last few months, has uh, um, filed or filed an application for uh, non-disclosed, actively managed, or partially disclosed. Yeah, we have not filed yet. Yeah, not what filed we yet. announced in announced, January sorry. is that we intend to um, make a filing, and we also are partnering with Presidian, who owns the IP of that structure, yeah. Um, can you give me your thoughts, or give the, uh, the, the audience your thoughts about, um, you know, how is that going to work? Is there, you know, there's several different proposals out there. Right. Um, maybe describe the, the, the Presidian model, the JP Yeah, Morgan's I mean, use. this is a model that's been uh, in discussion in the industry and with the regulators for almost 10 years now. Um, and the reason I would say, and there's, and Fidelity, Matt was here, has a, a structure that's out there. The reason I would say this is um, an interesting sort of development to come back at it again is because this is the structure that's probably most akin to the way ETFs work today. There's some different account uh, management um, at the custodian level, which I won't go into too much detail, that helps obscure the holdings from the marketplace. But it's the most akin to the way ETFs trade today. And that's why I think it's important to, to highlight the industry has long been behind this structure. Um, it's the, I think the more important story to talk about is like, yeah, it works. Like, well, it, we were saying it will work. Um, but the, the structure is, is a thing. It's, it's basically going to obscure the holdings so that you know, active managers, especially in active equity, can feel comfortable about putting their products into an ETF. Because if you did, if you knew or didn't know, I mean, obviously one of the most important features of an ETF is that it's and the holdings are disclosed daily, so you can take a look what's in there. Well, in active management, clients of that you know 11 or 13 trillion dollar market um, don't see holdings on a regular basis, and that's because the managers want to obscure sort of some of their trading strategies um, so they're not sort of out in the world, and that is what we're trying to solve for. So structure aside, um, I think the more important thing to focus on is momentum in the ETF industry for new structures and to solve some of these very um, back-end processes that no one would be interested in understanding that have been on the docket at the SEC and within regulators for, for years, probably, probably it's eight to ten years. There's lots of things that we as an industry have been trying to improve, and we get together as industry groups to say, you know, where, what is the direction that some of the, 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 the treatment of ETFs on have versus mutual funds? So um, I would say five years ago, ETFs had very, very limited ability to use derivatives um, because, and yeah, but I think it should surprise you because your mutual funds that are out there use derivatives in big, big, big numbers. 
ETFs had a really, really limited um, ability to use derivatives. Um, one of the issuers, PIMCO, moved that forward just two years ago after probably six or seven years of going at it with the SEC to explain why if you're comfortable with a mutual fund taking on that instrument, you should be comfortable with the ETF given that most derivative markets are the most liquid and most transparent markets that there can be. So. It's, it's small things like that. This is a bigger like headline version of moving the ETF structure forward so that we can offer more product. It's our, um, oblig it's our obligation as issuers to show why that structure will work, why it will price efficiently, and why you should be comfortable with the way that the market making will, will work. Um, so we'll do that with the SEC. And all we're at the only stage that um, I think Presidian and Lake Mason are at is they have filed an exemptive application the SEC is undergoing change right now. We're under a new administration, so we need to wait till those those folks get in their seats and can look around, find the bathroom, and then come come and talk to us about it. Um, so you'll see um, you'll see activity this summer on it. So I would keep watching it. I think the, the the brass ring to grab for the industry is moving the structure forward in ETFs to be more akin to the offering that clients have with the mutual funds. So getting some parity there is the way I look at it. You guys want to add anything? I mean. Yeah. Um, and, you know, maybe sort of a, a follow-up question for uh, a point on this. Um, most of the active ETFs currently out there where the gathered access, uh, assets are, are fixed income, uh, actively managed ETFs, yeah. and, and the equity ones haven't really caught on, I think, because of the disclosure. Do you think that the disclosure, uh, the daily disclosure for an active fixed income manager is as important as, as for equity, um, meaning that, uh, you know, yeah. a, a fixed income manager doesn't feel like they don't care if they disclose their portfolio every day because, no, it's going to be harder for people to replicate that. I'll give you a little inside baseball and then I'll answer the question. I think generally, yes, I think equity uh, managers are, are reticent to put their holdings in something, their portfolio into something that discloses holdings every day. Um, fixed income have felt a little more comfortable about it because as we discussed in the prior panel, panel some of those markets are um, over the counter, a little more opaque, like there's just a little bit more ease about the exact bond I'm sticking into this portfolio. It doesn't mean you can replicate all of my strategy. Um, but I, but I, I will also say this is spectrum. Um, I've been working at JB Morgan for four years since I left BlackRock and just being in the house to explain to PMs what they should and shouldn't be concerned with, I'm sure you do this too, Quinn, is there's a lot more like, oh, didn't realize that that is what I was up against. Didn't realize that that's okay. So the, we've had several managers that are willing to put certain things in a transparent vehicle, and we've gotten more, more momentum in putting things in a transparent vehicle. And I think there's going to be a spectrum. Some things people will want to really, in a very high conviction portfolio, something with a small number of names, like they'll probably want to put that, you know, lock that down in something that is periodically disclosed. Something else a little bit down the spectrum, spectrum that they feel a little more comfortable is, is larger, larger positions and names, maybe not. Um, so I've, I'm really hopeful that actually we'll move both things forward. Um, the traditional perception is that, yeah, equity is harder than fixed income. That's probably true. Um, we have a alternative strategy that we just launched in September, and this manager was very open to putting everything out there. Um, and we have look-through holdings every day, all the way down through all the derivatives that are in there. And you know, he just didn't see it as an issue, and, and we were able to go. So, did you have a question? Two questions. Oh, well. sorry. Oh, one yeah. gentleman over there in the. Yeah. In this world of transparency that seems to have come up over the last eight, nine years, uh, how much do you think it's cost the ETF industry in profits by having these disclosure requirements? Of not being able to by, by do the structure? By having to disclose. Um, no, I, the, the operating an ETF business and having to disclose is as simple as putting a file onto a website. There's no... There's no complexity to it, if, if that's your question. No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, it's more from the standpoint that having your uh, competitors see what you did and when you did it is a lot of information. And here, if they didn't have that, basically you're leaving profits on the table because 
you can't afford to spend a lot of money to come up with a strategy to put it out there and have it immediately stolen. Yeah, thanks for clarifying the question. So 95, maybe 97% of products today follow an index. So the rules are transparent to everybody and those holdings no one's really looking at, right? If you were to put more active strategies into a portfolio and it would be transparent every day, you're right. There are some things that, as I mentioned on the spectrum, you would reserve to put it in the periodically disclosed and you would match the disclosure maybe that you are, you're doing in your other, your other strategies like monthly or quarterly. There are some things where you have to ask yourself where, who and where is a replication like that going to actually occur? Who will spend the, who will spend the counter part of that money to replicate that strategy, which can be pretty complex and expensive to do anyway. So the, I, I think what you're asking is like, how do you value your IP and when are you going to sort of offer it, you know, open source versus not? And we make, and I, as I said, we make the decisions on a spectrum. And then we generally think about the fact of like, what would someone do with that information at the end of the day? Is it really going to tell them what I'm going to do next week? what I'm going to do in next quarter? Is it going to tell them how I'm going to trade when there's a market event like Brexit or the, the overnight election results? I might move my portfolio around very quickly. That would be very difficult for you to understand what my decision making was until probably way after the fact. So what is the value of that? I think that's the, the, the spectrum I, I spoke about. I don't think we're losing money. I think we're trying, we, have to, we have to think about it as a business strategy and as a product strategy. In the old days, old days, uh, be prior to ETFs, competitors laid traps for each other in the bond market. You, we, we all heard about, we all heard about the, the events. Are you going to tell me that those things couldn't happen now with that kind of information? I wouldn't say that. I would say that the markets are different and they're very, very, very connected. So we'd have to ask ourselves, are those opportunities really there as much as they were? The markets are big. The markets are all electronic. The markets are, there's all kinds of different market making. You know, can you want, can you go head to head that way anymore? I don't know, probably to a degree, but there's also the advent of all the innovation and the way things trade today. Just a thought, more to discuss for sure. Okay, thank you. There was back there, I think. Yep. Get you next. <laughs> Sorry. For, um, for an actively, um, managed ETF, have you guys thought about basically just bifurcating that portfolio? So you have um, one portfolio that really is like an ETF where it is daily disclosing, and then you just have something that's that's a mutual fund, right, for the part that's going to be the more the secret sauce part, and then just kind of have Put the together. client. Yeah, the client yeah, it's just really buy too. Well, if that way you could kind of, because, yeah. you know, cause, I mean, I, we invest a lot in hedge funds, so. Right. There's a there's a lot of hedge fund managers. They kind of have these core holdings that just sit around forever. Yeah. Right. And then then they and the, do then they're kind of tactical stuff mm. that they could do shorter term. You guys could do that and just do that. Put it in a mutual fund. Thing I think it's a do it great, together. But that's I mean, a that's cool, cool idea. Actually, um, we think we we played with the Legos of like the structures that we can stick in an ETF all the time. Um, it's a really really good idea. It's like having a sleeve, right? And um, what we run up against is. Um, now you add to, so the, the trick of ETF product development is you have a portfolio and then you turn it into a security. And so it's the security part where some of that stuff would fall down, but it's a really good idea. Meaning how do I, how do I, how do I, how does a market maker price the mutual fund part of that portfolio? And how do I make that, um, you might run into the same problem. Like how do I make that transparent to them so they can make the right price? That's the next step. Yeah. Depending on how you do that. Yeah. So I our mean, this alternative would be a, products. This would be more for a more sophisticated, like a bigger um, institutional investor, but that's better because you really want the big money. You don't want small Yeah, people. no, I mean, just because uh, we do that today. We have a, um, we have a multi-strat alternative beta product. It has three sleeves in it. And it's, it's, it's notion is it actually builds the hedge fund exposures, um, actually. So we have a long short portfolio, right? So we can hold every security in there or we can use a swap. So we use different different ways to achieve the same exposure. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about can you make it into a security? Why why make it exchange traded at that point? And it gives you a really heady question of what to do. <laughs>
with when it yeah. used to be a lawyer? It's when I used to be a lawyer when I dealt with the regulators. It's always, if they say a, they want A, B, C, you give them A, B, C. Even though D, E, F is probably way better, or you don't even give them A, C, B. It, it just, you just yeah. give them exactly what it looks like that they want, but it functions the way you want it. It's yeah. just easier to get that through faster. Yeah, but. exactly. No, it's a really, really interesting idea. <clears throat> yeah, and, and I think also, too, that it's not just... The, uh, you know, making it a security, a lot of these things, a lot of these ideas and product development, it's uh, that long regulatory lead time that, you know, we talked about. And and just to, to honest point before, it's only been a couple of years that an uh, active ETF could hold derivatives. So. Yeah, we're working on it. We're getting there. It could uh, non-disclosed, uh, partially disclosed uh, active ETFs. I think the first application went into the SEC in 2004, 2005. 2008, I think. Or, yeah. yeah. But that, that's an extreme version. So yeah. let me give you another story really quickly. Um, we recognize a gap in the ETF market um, in the alternative space, so we built out a alternative ETF. And the biggest hurdle in that was the time that it would take to put through the regulatory process. And so at that time, I was getting a lot of rainy day predictions from our lawyers, like, you're not going to get this through for two years. No way. Um, sometimes when you put effort into something, if you have a big portfolio in terms of product development and you need to spend an inordinate amount of time on one product, you probably will not make that choice because it's not worth the return on other things you could be doing. But in our case, we did really want to pursue it, and we got it through in six months with the help of New York Stock Exchange, of course. Um, so those regulatory timelines can be really different. They're getting better. They're getting better. It's six months is almost a record, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was, and it was chock full of derivatives and all kinds of fun stuff. And so, Here's a question I don't understand. If, I'm a, if I own a mutual fund, I'm not exactly sure who the SEC is trying to protect. I believe I see those holdings twice a year. Normally quarterly, yeah, quarterly. yeah, yeah normally quarterly. quarterly or monthly now. I, I guess what I don't understand is if the SEC exists to protect me, the customer, um, where's the disconnect if in an actively traded portfolio I could see those once a month, once a week? It's still far better disclosure than uh, in a mutual fund wrapper and sort of, it seems to be a better outcome than where we are now. Do you want to explain the reason why you need portfolio holdings disclosed? Um, <laughs> you kind of need, you kind of need portfolio holdings disclosed daily effectively because in some applications you might, you might need that just because some people, some institutions for example, need to make sure that they're within certain issuer limits for example, and so monthly may not cut it because monthly may be struck at month end when you know, there's, a, you know, there's a little bit more rebalancing around ind indices. Um, but I think of it as, 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 as twofold and hope to answer some of these questions as well, right? You've got the daily disclosure ETFs which have created a tremendous amount of the correct level of transparency for the investor population, right? You've got the non-transparent active, which may be, you know, perhaps it's, you know, there's less of a quantitative or model base. It doesn't have to be, um, but we, we tend to have both, right? So we have the actively managed ETF or active um, that tends to look at kind of a, a transparent structure. We also have a non-transparent active structure in Canada, for example, with our Canadian lineup. And, and there, it, you know, we have a little bit more protection around the model and the, and the quantitative. So there's many reasons why, you know, a monthly versus a quarterly might exist. But daily, I think of it as, as providing the comfort level for all investors, right? Regardless of their needs, the ability to track cash flows on a day in, day out basis to make sure that you're not violating any limits, that type of thing, as being very healthy for the market as opposed to, oh, I'm worried that someone's going to come out and, 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 and grab that secret from me. I don't know, Dave, if you want to add anything about arbitrage at all, but yeah. I, I can tell I you why the SEC, well, I can tell you, we will tell you why the SEC, what SEC is trying to protect you from, so go ahead. Yeah, so yeah. I think the, the big thing that came up and kind of why that uh, periodically disclosed hasn't made it through yet from at least the SEC standpoint is the um, ability to uh, give the client a fair price through the arbitrage mechanism and whether or not 
Um, if there's not full disclosure on what those holdings are, what the basket is on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, they fear that, that could, there could be dislocations in that market as a result of that. Uh, with mutual funds, since you just transact once a day at 4 o'clock, they've found comfort in that. But with that intraday trading, um, the, the trading that occurs from 9.30 to 4 within an ETF, uh, they, they have a lot of concern around how would you be able to know for sure that you're getting a fair value when you trade it at noon um, without being able to see what is within the fund and how that nav is being struck throughout the day. Yeah, yeah. and it's important to note that that, and, and thanks, for the, thanks for the hint there. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's important to note that, you know, that, that daily holdings does kind of very much feed into the creation of redemption process in a direct feed through, right? So the whole idea that um, ex shares are exchanged and created at, at 4 p.m., right, at nav, so that there's no wealth transfer, right? and that you're getting like for like value you know exactly what you're getting right there's no surprises right so you so that gives a lot of comfort around the structure as well um, looks like we only have about a minute and a half left here um, is there any more questions yeah, uh, you mentioned about 1984 with the regulatory process yeah do you even know the code? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I wish all the luck on you. <laughs> With the adoption of the generic listing for yeah. actives, do you, do you see that as I'm still just a small part of the overall assets? But do you see that becoming more popular here in the next couple of years? Oh yeah, it's great. It saved me last week, with, last year, with two fixed income products. Those came out right when I was about to go headlong into a really simple high yield process. You know, I was like, great. Now I have generic listing standards for active fixed income. Uh, we just launched a short duration, uh, a short income product. It was really super helpful. So it's a good thing. In 2007, when the first generic listing standards came out for international equity and fixed income ETFs, we went from launching five to seven products a year that year. And this is back in my old days, which I have. I, I come from a very storied um, provider. But we launched 36 products that year. So that's just an amazing example of like how... You know, we used to have filed 19 befores for international equity, you know, and it would take 18 months then. And for so treasury, that was, too. <laughs> you know, we can thank Scott Ebner and the industry for, for leading that because um, he did it with the Amex and then later on ARCA and everyone accepted it. But the generic list standards are great. My only problem now is I have to prove, I have to spend some work proving why my 19 before doesn't fit the generic listing standards. So it's a little bit of extra effort because, you know, the exchange is right. Like, why aren't you using them? So... How novel, really? Do you, do you really need that instrument in your portfolio? So I'm kind of like knocking the tires to make sure we can use them more often. Oh, oh sorry. Um, I'm not sure this is how I'm supposed to be about it. Do you fear at all that the Thank you. bigger is better with what it is bringing in? Therefore, maybe starve out smaller issues from the capital markets permanently as a result of These guys are the biggest ones. I can tell you what it's like to be a little provider, but I'll let you start. <laughs> so. um, no, no, not, not from the ETF standpoint, yeah. but from the single issuer standpoint. If you're not in an ETF, then you're part of the out class and therefore have a much higher, a harder time. Being Meaning if you're not in an index or, right. or something. Right, if you're not okay. in an index, you're a corporate. More corporate. Yeah. By the rest of Wall Street, and so therefore, the capital raising function for smaller companies or even mid-sized companies, you know, turns into turns into a, uh, a non-competitive uh, uh, situation for them. So, if you're not in an index, if you if you're not in an index, it's harder to raise capital. Is that that's yeah. Okay. That's what the question is. Yeah. Right. Because there's, this, there's a liquidity premium. So, if you're a value conscious person, all of a sudden you have to provide a liquidity premium. Mm. to an issuer if you're looking at single stock selection as opposed to an ETF? And so how much liquidity premium do you assign to that versus a liquidity, liquidity discount for something else just because of the ETF function? That's what I'm asking. Um, so I would say, I mean, there's a, a portion of it is to note that um, although there's been this rapid growth in indexing and especially ETFs, how they fit into that um, indexing landscape, it's still only about 35% of all the assets, the trade um, within the marketplace. Um, and then when you get into international and then fixed income, that drops down 15%, 5%. 
Um, and then just naturally the secondary market activity that occurs, um, which is about 90% of uh, an ETF's volume just stays in that secondary market. Um, what we see is that only about 1.5% of the, the daily trading is occurring um, with uh, four ETFs that are trading globally um, for the underlyings. So I think that there's still opportunities for um, price discovery out there for the, for the remainder that although that indexing has grown, ETFs have grown, um, just the, the nature of how they trade, uh, I, I don't know that um, it's really been if it's trickled down to the liquidity premium and the underlying holdings yeah. yet. And just to kind of summarize, I think it, it's also a, a question as to, is the liquidity being starved out or being stolen from another place, right? That's, that's kind of the, the crux of your question. And we think of it as being a net add, right? Because that all-to-all -all kind of market that David alluded to didn't exist perhaps 20, 25 years ago to the same extent it did today. The underlying market and the trading still occurs, but you don't have that kind of all-to-all -all trading that's going to get you price discovery on something like a Brazil ETF, like an EWZ, right? You're not going to get that level of liquidity, but all that activity that's occurring is not necessarily depriving liquidity out of another sector. It's really blossoming it and, and allowing people to, to access and get price discovery and transparency in whatever they're doing. And, and that price has a lot of information that's valuable. So I think of it as, as a net benefit as opposed to something that's going to starve a smaller issuer out of the market. I think they, if you think about like someone who's trying to issue debt for the first time, have a lot of a, 10 other things they need to worry about more important than am I going to be in an index or am I going to be in an ETF? Because they're, to even get in the door, the larger banks, right? You're thinking about many other things, um, fundamentals aside. So we had a question there. The idea that the holdings are not disclosed on a daily basis, how do you get an indication to the market makers to make a fair market in that product? Yeah, that's the crux of what the SEC will evaluate and the way the structure works. So quickly, there will be um, basically a supercharged IIV. Do you guys know what intraday value is? It's a third party that calculates the value of the portfolio and, and publishes it every 15 seconds today. Um, that will be improved. It will go out every second. Um, also, and so that means that there is a very small group of um, administrators, not market makers, that will have um, the portfolio holdings so you can deliver a, a basically a true valuation intraday, intr you know, every second to the marketplace. So the concept is taking the arbitrage arguments that we've made for a long time in, in the ETF industry about how does arbitrage work and what is sufficient enough to make an effective price. And that's what we'll be proving out with the SEC and talking to them about. Um, but that's effectively how the structure works. There's a third party supercharged IAV that's going to be produced. Um, and then there's also um, a mechanism that our administrator, when we build out this operating structure, will provide to market makers so that they can hedge one for one the portfolio without seeing the holdings. Um, super complex. I, I would hate to. I will draw a map for you if you want. <laughs> but I just like I hate to go down that rabbit hole. But the idea down. is there are some people in the ecosystem of the trade that have the holdings. It's just that we're obscuring them from the general market, and we're making sure that. So that arbitrage opportunities one for one on a, can work, that we that we provide and facilitate some other types of hedging activity. I see. So yeah. the market makers would have oh, the holdings just so they can hedge it. What's that? The market makers would have the holdings, portfolio holdings, so they can hedge it. Will have the holdings. They will not. No. Oh, they will not. No, they will not. Oh, interesting. No, they will have a way to price, looking at a model price that is the a much better indication of the value than they do today. I think all the, the proposals that are out there for uh, periodically disclosed, they're pr just trying to provide enough information so the market makers can make a market without knowing what's in the portfolio. Yeah. And there's just different mechanisms of how we're getting that information to the market. And the way, you know, that Chris and everyone would have told you and Reggie would have told you if, they, if you asked them about this, because they are, they help in this discussion, they participate in the discussion of the 10 years, is the way that their businesses make markets isn't one for one in the way you probably think about it. So 
they manage and hedge in, across a book of risk. And that's, that's what we're trying to move the SEC towards is looking at, you know, the way they'll still be able to do that. All right. I think we're significantly over time here now. <laughs> um, so just want to thank the panel and, uh, and uh, thank Nicholas and uh, thanks everybody for coming today.